Uh, welcome, dear listeners, to our first podcast edition of the United Nations Office for Disarmament Affairs Vienna Conversation Series. I am Rebecca Joven. I'm the chief of the Vienna office for the UN Office for Disarmament Affairs. And we are coming to you today from the UN's home here in Vienna, the Vienna International Center. Uh, the title of our conversation series today is Where to Next for Youth in Disarmament? And I'm very excited to be discussing this topic. It's one of our big priorities for the Office of Disarmament Affairs. And I'm even more excited about our panel today. We have a great lineup for you. Um, I'm really thrilled to introduce our three speakers with us in the studio today. First, my boss, the Under Secretary General for Disarmament Affairs um, and High Representative, Ms. Izumi Nakamitsu. Izumi, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Izumi has been in her current role since uh, 2017. Before that, she was the Assistant Secretary uh, for Crisis Response at the United Nations Development Program from 2014. And she has a long career in the UN system. And she's also an international gender champion. So we're delighted to have her with us here today. Uh, next, I have Kasia Sequoyer Slavner. Welcome, Kasia. Thank you so much. Um, Kasha is a Gen Z uh, multi-award winning documentary filmmaker at 15, the impressive age of 15, I still can't believe that, Kasha founded the Global Sunrise Project, it's a social impact media hub, and her first documentary uh, film, The Sunrise Storyteller, screened internationally at 60 film festivals and won 30 awards, that's an impressive showing, including the Ron Kovic Peace Prize and the Eva Haller Women Transforming Media Awards. And currently she is in production for her second feature uh, uh, documentary, 1.5 Degrees of Peace, which is focused on advancing a unified movement for peace and climate justice. Last but not least, we have Louis Reitman. Hello, Louis. Hi, I'm so thrilled to be here. It's great to have you here, Louis. Louis is 25 years old, a ripe age of 25, and grew up in Germany. And he works as a research associate at the Vienna Center for Disarmament and Nonproliferation Affairs here in uh, Vienna. And he focuses there on export control issues and sanctions implementation. And he is also a member of the youth group for the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization. So I'm very excited to have all three of you here. I wanted to say a few words for our listeners before we get started on our Leaders for Tomorrow uh, workshop series, which Louis and Kasha are part of. Um, they were both selected from a pool of 400 applicants to participate in this latest training program for young people, which is part of our UNODA Youth for Disarmament initiative. And with the financial support of the Republic of Korea, this group of 25 young leaders have been exploring linkages between disarmament, nonproliferation, arms control, and other issues with uh, different topics related to international peace and security. And they've had monthly sessions with practitioners from our office, activists, researchers uh, from civil society, and innovators of uh, youth-led initiatives. Um, and I hope we'll get a chance to hear from both of them about their experience. Um, when they wrap up this Leaders for Tomorrow uh, series, they will present their ideas and projects to engage local communities during a side event at the UN General Assembly's First Committee meeting in October. Um, so with that, I'd like to get our conversation going. And I wanted to start with a question that um, is related to what are arguably the two existential threats for um, humanity, and that is climate change and nuclear weapons. So um, public mobilization around climate issues is often cited as a prime example for impactful youth-led civic engagement. And I'd like to ask you all uh, what you think is needed to achieve that same level of mobilization in the disarmament community. Izumi, maybe we'll start this one with you, if you don't mind. Okay, well, thank you. I'm, I'm so uh, impressed by both of you, Kasha and Louis. Um, you know, people actually look at um, a climate movement and then see how young people are really changing the world. I mean, without their commitments and voices, um, all these things that have happened in the past couple of years, 
probably would not have happened, uh, at least not with that speed and, and you know, the sort of a, a force of, uh, um, you know, voices uh, coming uh, from various parts of the world. But um, if you look at the history, you actually um, notice that in the disarmament and, and peace movements also, uh, young people have been making uh, quite impressive achievements. Um, you know, going back to issues like anti-personnel landmine conventions, cluster munitions, and of course, most recently, uh, ICANN, um, which resulted in the, uh, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. You know, we're here today, just a few days before the, the first meeting of states parties. I mean, all these, um, you know, important disarmament instruments um, behind them were always young people's voices and activism. So, you know, we need to remember that and also we need to um, learn from those experiences as well. Um, one thing that cuts across these, um, you know, the common features of those past achievements is how young people had a huge, uh, you know, really strong passion, uh, motivation, um, and then those motivations came from uh, their learning of the facts, you know, how those, um, you know, cluster munitions and anti-personnel landmines, how they impacted ordinary people and how those people, ordinary civ civilians were really, um, you know, victimized. Uh, the nuclear weapons issue is the same. Um, they learned from the historical experiences of um, Hibakushas and of course uh, the survivors of nuclear testing uh, as well. Um, and that really gave massive passions to young people. They started to organize and they became a very strong voice. Um, so one thing I think we can do is to, to give more platforms and opportunities for these younger people to learn um, what are the issues. Now, disarmament is all about security and it is about our security, your security and, and your future. So in that sense, it's exactly the same as the climate change. So um, why don't we you know, engage in those learning opportunities um, and then connecting those various young people around the world so that their voices will be enhanced uh, to the global level and then start to make impact at the international policy making um, platforms. So I think, you know, initiatives are there, I think, at all different parts of the world. But if we can, as the United Nations, can help you also connect, give you more platforms to learn, um, and learning mean, means that also you will acquire more skills in campaigning and organizing, uh, then I think uh, we are probably talking business to change the world. Okay. Thanks, Izumi. Thanks for reminding us of the really rich history that we have in this area and that we can build on and the importance, of course, of education and empowerment. Uh, Louis, what's your thought on the issue? Well, um, I'd like to start with a word of caution, actually, and, and not to bring down the mood in the room, but I think, you know, let's be careful with how many expectations we put on young people. Young people are, you know, trying to get an education, trying to get a job that in formative periods of their lives, uh, trying to make a living, you know, in a world that is increasingly insecure with global competition for resources and opportunities facing a climate catastrophe and, um, you know, not even to mention the two and a half years of pandemic that have mm -hmm. really hit young people hard. Um, so what I would say is absolutely young people have a huge stake in disarmament because we're the people who will have to live with the consequences of today's decisions the longest. And um, at the same time, the fact that we have to talk about trying to mobilize, get, get a kind of mass mobilization of young people on disarmament, like on the climate change issue, is not a good thing. It, it illustrates that until this point, we haven't made enough progress on this. Don't get me wrong, young people absolutely are capable of taking on this responsibility. And um, 
you know, I'm continuously impressed by how responsible, organized, and very clear in their demands the, the members of our generation are. Um, but let's not forget that there are already lawmakers, government officials, diplomats, world leaders out there whose responsibility it is right now and today to make progress on disarmament. So it's not for young people to fix this, but if other generations don't do it, we will anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and I think uh, Izumi and Louis both, it's, um, you know, th this issue of intergenerational responsibility, I think, is an important one, right? And it isn't necessarily one that is applicable exclusively to this line of work, the disarmament field, but it cuts across. And maybe that leads me to you, Kasha, as well, because you embody very much this, this connection between the climate agenda and the peace and security agenda. So I'd love to hear your thoughts as well on the topic. For sure. Um, so Izumi referenced the strong history of youth advocating for disarmament. Um, I've grown up in the peace movement surrounded by women who are in their 70s, 80s, and 90s who have been part of that movement and shaped that movement and learned from their intergenerational wisdom about um, peace and disarmament issues. Um, the thing that I see is, of course, that, that word of connection versus disconnection. A lot of young people who are not actively under the threat of nuclear weapons don't understand how it's affecting their lives currently, the same way that they might understand the climate crisis as an imminent threat for not only countries in the global south right now, but for themselves right now and in the, into the future. Um, something that I see often missing from the conversation around disarmament um, can be that connection to people's emotions about the issue of security and insecurity and human rights and justice and equity that happens in the climate space. Connecting with people's emotions, whether it be through storytelling or personal interactions that you have, um, is really a powerful way to, I guess, um, compel people to learn more about the issue itself. Because to me, I believe um, that's my job as a, as a storyteller, is to ignite that spark, to get people to learn uh, more and take on the issue in their own community. So sparking that um, through emotional connection um, will also be more sustainable in the long term um, instead of the way that the news cycle works, which is like, here's this one issue that you should care about for two or three weeks and then it's gone. If you have that emotional connection, you will care about seeing progress in the long term and perhaps not lose your faith that, you know, when you're advocating for disarmament, which is a really tough and sometimes stagnant issue, as Leo referenced, um, it can be exhausting and challenging to continue to challenge those power structures. So, um, yeah, I think that it's it's all about connection. Great, Kasha. Thanks for that and and for sharing uh, your you know your the human side of of the issue, which I I agree is really key. Um, we often think of these things as technical issues or abstract issues, but really it comes down to human beings, human security, uh, and, and, and our, our daily lives. So it's, it's good to, to bring it home to that. So let me um, ask uh, the three of you perhaps a, a more personal question, and that is um, what your reaction is um, to uh, to the issue of diversity in, in disarmament. When you hear diversity, uh, equity, inclusion, when you think of those concepts in relation to disarmament, what does that mean to you? And how do you think we get to that reality? Maybe, Kasha, we'll start with you this time. Um, I think it goes back to that, that idea of power structures. Um, inclusion can be difficult when the power structure doesn't serve the people you're trying to include, and including them in the process, um, allowing them to open up and share their very personal experiences um, with issues that have happened in their own communities. If you're working in a space that doesn't feel collaborative, it will be tough to, um, to gain that mutual respect and understanding that's needed to inform future policy decisions. Um, so. Sometimes the consultation process can feel extractive in terms of let me, you know, sometimes as youth, when we go into these consultation spaces, let me hear your stories and then let me like 
ask you all about your own experiences, but then just leave it at that. Where's the relationship that continues down the line? This isn't always, um, but sometimes. And that can often close young people off to working within the space again. Um, so I really think it's about challenging those structures and um, trying to, to work with the constituents that you're, that you're um, inviting into your space to see how you can more creatively address the challenge at hand. Um, yeah. Izumi, what do you think? I know it's an issue you're passionate about. What's your take? Yes. Um, you know, of course, uh, bringing diversity and then having an inclusive process is the right thing to do. Um, you know, women and, and different sort of age groups, um, you know, different um, nationalities, uh, backgrounds, all these different diverse backgrounds participating in discussions and also decision makings is the right thing to do. Uh, but I also add that it is a smart thing to do as well. Um, you know, if you have diverse perspectives uh, in the negotiations, you might think it is it gets more difficult to, to actually bring those positions together and, and, and form a, an agreement. Uh, but um, it's actually not really true. Um, diversity brings new perspectives and creative, innovative approaches into a, a very challenging, um, you know, discussions, and um, and therefore it's more likely to come up with um, something that sticks. You know, it's more sustainable uh, decisions that will actually make impact um, on the issues that you're trying to to address, and we have seen that actually happening. Um, you know, in, in my sort of immediate disarmament and multilateral discussions also, um, you know, when we have new younger female diplomats coming into that community in the process discussing new challenges, uh, visibly you can see that there are new ideas inserted into discussions and, and therefore what will come out of that process will be more impactful, more effective, and more sustainable. Um, so I think um, many people now understand this, and therefore it's not, you know, for example, the gender um, parity issues. It has we have been making a lot of progress, um, and um, but a lot of people actually look at this from a perspective of yes, of course, it's the right thing to do to to you know address the inequalities, etc. But I think also more and more people are beginning to see that, oh, this is interesting. This is also a, a smart thing to do. Um, because you are engaged in those discussions because you want to find a solution to a big challenge. So you want to have a good decision that will work, uh, that will be more sustainable, that's long lasting. And a lot of studies um, for example, in you know peace negotiations, um, it, there is a, um, a clear um, um, evidence that where women are involved in that negotiations, um, you know after the the agreement is reached, and when you get to the, the implementation phase, those peace agreements with women at the table last longer. It's the same for international um, disarmament issues as well. So, um, be impactful, um, be sustainable. Um, let's uh, try to tackle, you know, those very difficult issues, um, both because it's right to have diverse people involved, but also it is a smart thing to do. I would be remiss if I didn't mention that June was Pride Month, so I would like to take a moment to celebrate the extraordinary contributions of people of the LGBTQ community uh, to disarmament as diplomats, activists, educators, researchers. And I think that queer people often have or can have a special relationship to disarmament. Um, tragically, still, queer people are often survivors of violence and abuse and of disenfranchisement and exclusion. And yet, and I'm so proud to be able to say this, many members of the queer community make extraordinary lives for themselves very fiercely and unapologetically. And they do this in spite of, of all of these things. So I think their contribution 
to disarmament, which can sometimes seem like an insurmountable challenge, um, is to bring the perspective that challenges that seem insurmountable don't have to be that. Um, so what I would really like to see is more active efforts to try and get queer people to connect with disarmament and to get that kind of spirit, that kind of energy and that kind of, um, you know, thinking that things are, can be possible if you persist um, into our space. But I also think that more broadly, while that work is still not completed, um, where we need more uh, representation uh, in terms of gender and um, uh, ethnic backgrounds and people's uh, cultural backgrounds. Um, um, so while that work is still not finished, I think it's time to start a conversation about now that we have more diversity at the panels, the delegations and the negotiating tables, how can we make sure that those people are allowed to infuse their contributions in negotiations at panels to the policy debate with their personal backgrounds? How can we make sure that people can um, let their cultural experiences or their experiences from uh, discrimination or all of what makes them uh, part of a diverse community influence their contribution to the disarmament debate because I think otherwise we run the risk of um, having almost visual representation but no actual representation of diversity in, in the content that, that matters. Yeah, it's interesting. All three of you have touched on or, or spoken in your own way about going beyond just the issue of representation, right? Obviously, that is a starting point. In order to have diverse perspective, you also have to have diversity in the room. But then how does that translate into practice and outcomes? This is really the, the crux, right? So uh, I appreciate you all sharing your, your thoughts on how we get there and the work that still lies ahead uh, in, in that area. Um, let me turn to something a little bit different. Um, and this is particularly very excited to hear from uh, the young people in, in the room here from Kasha and, and Louis on, on this issue. And it's about um, getting your advice on, on the tools that we need for youth uh, empowerment and engagement. What works to really uh, uh, empower and engage youth? Um, you may know that the UN Secretary General, both in his agenda for disarmament, which he launched back in 2018, but also more recently in 2021 through his common agenda, has really put the issue of youth and youth's role uh, front and center in those agendas. Um, youth as agents of change um, in, at the local level, at the national level, and also in the multilateral uh, field. Um, I'm curious to hear from all of you, what kinds of activities, what kinds of tools do you think uh, are most impactful in attracting young people to disarmament? And how can we facilitate that, that role as agents of change? So I definitely want to start with the young people on this one. So Louis, you go first. <laughs> um, well, so of course there, there need to be different offerings for different people because I recognize that not everybody is as crazy as I am wanting to make this field their, their career. Um, so um, I think we need to differentiate between what we offer to people who, who seek professional involvement in, in the field and people who we can engage um, more in a grassroots political kind of um, level. So I would definitely want to highlight um, one thing, and that is that young people are really ready to take on responsibility for decision making. Um, I can only reiterate again, and we see it from the, the climate change movement, young people are not afraid of making difficult decisions, and they're really well prepared to do so. So as a call to the general UN system and to all of the member states, um, it currently takes a long time to become a decision maker in the foreign service of your country or in, in the UN system. Um, change that, please, because um, there's so many young people with fantastic ideas who 
want to make those decisions and, and I think we'll be better off um, that way. Um, and then, of course, there are capacity building measures that we need to take to empower young people to get there in the first place. Um, the Leaders for Tomorrow initiative, I just want to highlight, has for me personally done a lot to give me strength and um, confidence in my professional career in this field. It has connected me to fantastic people like Kasha and it's really helped with the, the professional networking, putting people together who can then create projects and generate change uh, together. Um, but I also want to highlight uh, an initiative by the Vienna Center for Disarmament and Nonproliferation, where I work, and the um, Istituto Affari Internazionali. That was so hard to say. That was um, really well done, by the way. <laughs> which <laughs> is Molto bene. Uh, thank you. <laughs> which is the um, Young Women and Next Generation Initiative, where we um, have a dedicated young women mentorship program, where we put together graduates, um, students, young professionals um, with mentors one-on-one -on -one and we give them uh, career-changing opportunities. Um, but then we also need to think of those people that maybe don't want to uh, take a career in this field. And um, I think for those, um, educational resources are essential. And what I would really like to see is for, for young people to take those opportunities that already exist and to make the disarmament issue part of their political decision making. So when you step into the in front of the ballot box, when you decide about your civic engagement, make disarmament questions part of how you decide. Um, so um, with, with all those things, if we get all those things across the finish line, I think we'll be um, um, we've made some good progress. Thanks, Louis. That's great food for thought and a, and a vast uh, toolbox that you've presented to us. Kasha, what do you have to add to that? Um, I guess the best place that I can speak from is my experience as a storyteller um, and revisiting that idea of exposing people to new ideas. Um, so with the film that I'm currently working on, um, highlighting the experiences and stories of young people who are at living at the intersection of the climate crisis, of conflicts, of militarization, um, but from a solution-oriented perspective of what they're doing on the ground, in their communities, at the grassroots level, and also in multilateral spaces um, to unite all of these issues together and to address these issues together. Um, it's my hope that that will inspire more young people to engage with the issues of disarmament. Um, but the work doesn't stop there for myself. Um, it's about building and providing youth with um, educational resources, workshops, and advocacy um, campaigns that they can support, um, that they can start in their own communities after they've seen a film. So they start to feel that emotional connection. They feel compelled to learn more. And then they feel um, that they are able to take action in their own communities. Those are the, like, those are the three steps that I see um, just personally. My, my own project taking on, and, and I see that replicated with a lot of youth initiatives, um, with, I guess, the Leaders for Tomorrow program. I've seen that um, in so many different ways across the board with all of the participants who are engaging with the program, um, and that's so inspiring. Um, and, I mean, personally for myself, also, they're a really critical part of building out this film that I'm in production with right now and, and highlighting their stories and showcasing the work that they're doing. Um, in the disarmament space is so exciting to me. So, yeah. Hear, hear. You see me? I mean, what more can I add, <laughs> right? I um, you know, brilliant ideas. Now, I will build on, on what, they, what they already mentioned. Um, I, I think, first, this passion part, I think, is really hugely important. I mean, when I think about my own career, I mean, beginning was really wow, you know, what, what happened in my heart that really gave the motivation, the passion um, that I want to contribute. I mean, in the beginning, I didn't exactly know how or, or what I could do, um, but because I, I, I was moved, um, I wanted to learn more, and I wanted to actually start thinking about making these things uh, my, 
you know, professional career. So I think it's, um, you know, those inspirational moments that we could help provide. Uh, part of that will come from learning experiences, but much more, I would say, some human uh, contact and connections, um, you know, uh, and also expose younger people to uh, really inspirational moments, inspirational people. Uh, Etc. I think um, that is really, really important, and some visual, you know, um, you know movies and, and stories and, and all these things actually will be a great help. I think we need to take those elements into what we can also offer from the UN. Uh, and then I think also, you know, what you said, um, we need to, to look at different audiences and, and tailor our support to fit to a different groups of people who want to contribute. Some people will want to contribute as a community activist. Activists not in the sense of, you know, um, living on that kind of activities, but talking about those things at schools and sports clubs and even in a family, you know, community clubs, etc. cetera. Um, those things will eventually then add up as a political force to start changing things. Um, so I think those, that is the kind of a, a particular audience that we need to also become better at um, so that educators know um, disarmament issues are important for people, common people, ordinary people, because this is about their own security. Uh, and then we have students uh, who are also thinking about what kind of a international agenda which really in, in today's globalized world, international challenges and agendas are actually our agenda. It's, it's uh, impacting um, you know, daily lives of, of, of everyone. Um, and, but you, know, you, know, you don't know it when you're a student uh, trying to think about those things and what might be your future professional life. When they're thinking about those things, I think it will be useful to have educational learning materials uh, that will inform them. These are the sets of issues in security and disarmament areas. Uh, so I think, um, you know, young people's learning and networking uh, opportunities, tailoring that kind of an audience, I think is also quite important. And then uh, we have people like you who are already, you know, coming into the, the disarmament uh, expert field. Um, we do have good opportunities. I mean, they are also, um, like Vienna Center, you know, we, we, we do have really good, um, uh, respected organizations who, in a way, are actually bringing up those uh, young talents, and many of them will then eventually end up in the, the UN or diplomatic services of, uh, of different, different countries. Um, and then there we are investing with the help of member states. I think the member states actually see the need for more efforts like that. Um, because uh, the past 30 years or so, you know, during the post-war um, period, uh, we did, I mean, the, the world was a relatively uh, more peaceful um, a place. Um, of course, there are always wars um, that continued, uh, but we did not see the kinds of uh, security threats that we are now beginning to see again in the world. Um, so you know, security experts, many of them were interested in, in peacekeeping operation, peace building support, et cetera. Um, now getting also interested in disarmament, um, uh, arms control type of issues again. So I think we can do more to make sure that really detailed learning uh, materials will be made available. And with the online platforms, it has become easier to provide knowledge, expert, expert knowledge, um, to that category of audience as well. So I think it's, it's important to have um, tailored uh, support packages that um, we can put together. And, um, and we are now beginning to really seriously tackle those um, uh, issues. And that's why we have this um, you know, Youth for Disarmament and then uh, Leaders for Tomorrow. Uh, those are, you know, beginning to be really, you know, one of the flagship uh, activities of UNODA, and we would definitely like to continue uh, on the basis of advice from people like yourselves.
Thank you, all three of you. Great food for thought. Lots on the to-do list for all of us to continue our work. Uh, and Izumi, thanks for flagging also um, these initiatives. And I definitely want to point our listeners also to those resources, invite you to join us, uh, certainly join us in the Youth for Disarmament uh, family. Uh, it's open to all. Uh, just go on our website, www.youth Four, that's the number four, disarmament.org, or check us out at hashtag youth for disarmament. Uh, check out our online dashboard, uh, the disarmament um, education dashboard. A lot of uh, material out there, like Izumi mentioned, for the general public. We, we invite all of our listeners uh, to join us in, in, in those communities and contribute and learn and, and be part of the conversation. Um, you've already given us a lot of great ideas, and um, I've heard already some calls to action. Uh, but any final words from, from any of you that you'd like to share? Uh, Kasha, maybe start with you. If there's anything you feel you didn't uh, have a chance to say, you'd like to share with us. Um, I guess the most important part of building a, or mobilizing more youth um, towards taking on the cause of disarmament starts with kind of coalition building efforts, like reaching across issues, um, whether it's into climate justice or economic justice or gender equality movements, um, and having conversation with people outside of your regular circle, um, building friendships and relationships with those who are active on issues of justice. Um, because this is a justice issue. Um, we can do so much together um, and we can create so much um, positive change if we're, you know, if we're working with a larger audience. So I think it's, it's all about that connection again, yeah. Wonderful. Louis? Well, um, le let, me, let me talk to the young people directly. Huh? How about that? <laughs> dear young people, dear young people out there listening, um, I think, you know, building that kind of knowledge, that expertise, that takes a long time. But getting interested, fascinated, being passionate about the topic actually doesn't take a long time. I remember that the way that I became interested in this was at a conference here at the VIC. Uh, then Secretary General Ban Ki moon gave a speech about the importance of ending nuclear testing and that it really was a task for young people to take on and a job for us to finish. And he really made clear the huge existential threat that nuclear weapons still pose today uh, and how you know very acute that, that threat is. Uh, and that moment of realization for me was immense. And I think once you develop that consciousness for how big the issue is, it'll be really difficult not to think about it and not to care about it. Um, so please, you know, learn, ask questions and get involved and please check out the, uh, you know, Young Women and Next Generation initiative at the VCDMP. Uh, we'd be thrilled if you would participate. Wonderful. Izumi? Well, um, all I will say is that, um, you know, when you look at I'm a little bit old, so I, I think <laughs> about history and all that sort of thing. Um, you know, even though we're living in a very difficult circumstances, especially today, um, when you look at the history, you will find moments that are really impressive. I mean, impossible things have been changed and addressed and resolved. And it is all a result of you know, number one, understanding that this is wrong and we have to change it. And number two, people got together and then worked together. Um, so, you know, humanity, I think, collectively has achieved um, enormous things in the past. And I think we're in the moments in history, again, that we have to do that. Um, and uh, and I, I am a firm believer that we can do it. Yes, we can, spirit. Um, and otherwise, I would not be working for the United <laughs> Nations. But, uh, but I, I hope that young people today, despite all these difficulties, uh, you will feel and you will believe that, yes, we can. Thanks, Izumi. That's a great 
Great phrase to end on. I, I've certainly taken a lot of inspiration from our conversation today. I hope our listeners have too. And I want to thank the three of you for being part of the inaugural podcast version of the disarmament, uh, the Vienna Dis uh, conversation series. And uh, hopefully there'll be more. I think you've given lots of good ideas of other things we can tackle and why not do that in podcast format. So I hope um, we'll, we'll have more to come. So tune in, tune in for more Vienna Conversation Series, tune in for more Disarmament uh, uh, Today podcasts. And thank you to the three of you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Well done, us. Yes, well done. <laughs>